So every time he'd come out with a new car or something and he needed help getting it going and stuff, my dad would help him out quite a bit. And anybody else would call and talk to him, he'd stand there and talk and pace back and forth. He might sit on a tire, he might, you know, squat down or something. But when Richie would call, he would take a t the chair, turn it around, you know, the chair that was in the, in the little office, he'd turn it around and he would sit down and he would talk to him. Richie pretty much knew, Richie knew pretty much everybody in the area. He was very close with Al Goodrow. I mean, one night, we got rained out at Stafford, that, that was the year I was racing there. And uh, I'm coming down uh, through Willimantic, down Route 2, I'm getting off that exit, and I look in the mirror and this big orange truck is behind me. So I pull over to the side and it was him, Richie. And he had his car and his truck and uh, he says, hey, where does Buddha live? <laughs> He was going going to Goodrills. He was in the right direction. He just had to keep going straight. You know? And Richie, he was just, you couldn't help but like him when you first met him. He was so down to earth, fun loving. And yet he was a very smart man as far as building cars. So Al knew where to go to get the right information. So Richie Evans, you know, I, you know, I, I was friendly with Richie and, you know, I, I didn't run as many races probably I did with Bugsy and the other guys, you know, but because he ran New York a lot, and him and Jerry Cook, they were running for the national championship all the time. But Richie Evans was a probably the greatest modified driver it ever was, you know. Richie was kind of a you know that everyman type of hero that I don't think anybody who raced was. They might have been intimidated by him as a racer, but I don't think they were intimidated to go for him to go to him for help because he was. I don't think he. He put himself above them at all. I proudly wear all the time during the races. I support a armband oh, excellent. of the 61 also. Um, he was definitely all of our heroes. And I, most of the time, he always told everybody the truth, but you always wanted to beat Richie or at least try to run with him because he was the man. Richie Evans, they, you know, there they was a real gentleman race car driver. You know, Richie used to come up to my camper at, at Thompson. We used to camp under that tree. We become pretty good friends, and nobody ever complained that he was dirty driving or nothing. And he did it, and he built a lot of his own race cars. And he went to every race that he could race at. He'd race four or five nights a week sometimes if he could. And every track he went to, people loved him. You know, at a young age, I was very impressionable, and uh, you know, Richie was uh, a guy that inspired to his level. He he would show up at a place like this, and it would be like a hush would come over the whole place. Everyone knew Richie's Hollow was at the front gate. And he'd come in here and usually win the race, and uh, he built his own cars, he's his own man, and uh, made a lot of the calls himself, and totally admired the way he handled himself, you know, on and off the track. And uh, always wanted to be like Richie, you know, build my own cars and, and try to race full time, and uh, I thought he was just on top of the world. He's a great guy. His impact um, on modified racing was, was very, very far-reaching. I mean, um, Richie innovated a lot of things. Uh, Richie was a pretty good car builder in his own right. Um, and I think he did an awful lot to help a lot of the local guys, I mean, or, or those who had reached out to him. I don't think Richie ever turned anybody away. Really quiet guy. Uh, I really admired, admired how he built cars, and he kept them simple. They were very simple, but, boy, they were effective. They handled good. They ran good. And what I liked is that you watch him drive and he always looked relaxed. There was no such thing as up on a wheel. He, he always looked relaxed and in control all the time. One of the things about Richie where, you know, you had guys like Jeff Bodine and Maynard Troyer that were, you know, great guys and winning race drivers, but were very technical chassis people. You know, they did, their chassis stuff was according to science, you know, and, and engineering, where Richie was kind of a, you know, a homegrown backyard seat of the pants engineer. He was, he was an everyday guy party guy I mean he was he was a racer and I asked him I, and we were great friends and I asked him you know he went to Daytona he'd sit on the pole for the modified races the guys that went on to he'd beat them guys regularly in them shows and I asked him one time uh, Richie how come you I, I know you've had opportunities and he said well 
I know if I go down there now, I'm not going to get the best equipment. That, that doesn't work that way. And I make a good living. I love what I'm doing. He says, I'm a big fish in a little pond. When I go down there, I'm a little fish in a big pond. So, I mean, he had, he had it right. I mean, he loved racing. He loved doing it. So as long as he made a living, he wanted to race. He wasn't cocky. He wasn't. He'd help. He'd, you ask him a question, he'd tell you. He didn't try to hide nothing. He was a real gentleman of a race car driver out there, and he could drive. I was there. You saw the wreck? Oh, yeah. Uh, Slater and I used to go to Martinsville all the time when they ran the modified races. We went to everyone. I was at the track. Um, I was on standby to work pit road on Sunday. I think Richie's accident happened on a Thursday. Um, in fact, we had gotten down there on Tuesday, and so we had all been down there all week. In fact, partying with Richie, you know, among you know a lot of others. Yeah, that was a that was a bad day. I was standing in turn three watching practice, and because I was helping out Cisco, and you know, I was there with you know with the team fourteen, and um, ironically, because you always kind of watch Richie, you know, it was kind of like he was always the benchmark, always. So you you know kind of, so I watched him go down to the corner and as just as I you know gonna go back to watch Tony come up out of the corner because that's the car I really wanted to pay attention to you just sense there was something wrong because you could hear the, the car sounded it, it wasn't de-accelerating like it was supposed to I mean it's happening like that I was saying to yourself what was that so I went back to look and he was in the wall already so I mean I sensed there was something wrong but I didn't see the actual hit but I did see it hit and then you know, after, right after a hit, and then going along the wall. And then Tony was one of the first cars, and Tony spun around on purpose to stop to go to try to help him. So Tony was the first one to his car, but that's, that's where I was. Oh, I remember very well. I had gone to the bank one day, and when I came back, Tommy said to me, he said, Mom, come in the office, I gotta talk to you. And when he told me, he said Teddy and Linda Marsh had called and told him. I mean, I was devastated. I was right here in this house, and I remember looking at the cover of the Speedway scene, which used to come to the thing right down below there in the mailbox, and I couldn't believe it. I, it was just, it was beyond belief that someone of that caliber of race car driver was killed in a crash. I remember I was sleeping late on a Thursday morning, and a phone rang, and somebody told me that they'd heard this crazy thing that Richie'd been in a bad crash. And all I could think of you know, again, it's the first thing in the morning, you know, you're barely awake. I thought it was a highway crash. And uh, because, you, you know, your first thing is it's Thursday. It's not the weekend yet. You modified with practice on Thursdays uh, at Martinsville in the fall. Then as I was talking to this person on the phone, they, they said, no, 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 it was a racetrack deal. It was, a, you know, practice Thursday morning. And it all started coming to me. And they said, they, you know, they thought he'd been hurt really bad. And um, I said, I'll call you right back. And you think it's nothing, you know, it's... Absolutely. I was sitting in a <coughs> excuse me. I, w I was sitting in the parking lot. My wife was shopping, and I was waiting for her to come out. And racing wasn't big. I mean, new, big news. You never heard, right. you know, and uh, <laughs> come over the radio. You have this period where you just don't believe it uh, because after being involved in racing for years, I know how stories can get blown out of proportion, you know, with a lot of people telling them. And so I just, that part of me didn't want to believe it. And we had called my husband at home and he was devastated. And so I called uh, the uh, PR department at, at Martinsville. Uh, and talked to one of the PR guys there, Dick Thompson, who was the, the head guy there for years. And as soon as he knew who was on the phone, and as soon as you know, as soon as you kind of recognize each other's voices, you could just tell that it was probably as bad as you could possibly think it was, because he was broken up just talking about it. So I think, and I think everybody that everybody that was there can tell you all about that day, whether they watched it, whether they heard it, and and you're right, anybody that was driving in their car and heard it on the radio you know local news around here or if you were a knucklehead like me that worked a you know a wacky job 
you know, that let you sleep in on a Thursday morning and somebody woke you up, you know, you, you, you don't forget it. I, I remember Richie because they, they just, I, it was, it was unbelievable. It was just, it was really sad. And that was an, an error that was also dark as well. Um, you, you, we lost a lot of drivers back then. What I, my understanding is the cars were basically too rigid, and so the G-forces, if one of the race cars hit the wall, would be absorbed by the body of the race car driver. And so we lost Richie, who was probably the best modified racer of all time. We lost Charlie Jasonbeck, we lost Corky Cookman, and then even in more recent years, unfortunately, we lost some people like John Blue the Third, et cetera. It's a really sad thing. Racing is dangerous, always has been, but they worked hard, I think, after Richie to try to get the cars to be a little bit more I will, you know, expendable, so to speak. Oh, he deserved to get in there, definitely. It was, you know, all the races he won and everything else. And I think it's fantastic. It was way overdue. Um, you know, it, it, and I, I'm proud of Richie. You know, I, I, I'm proud to say that he's there. I mean, it's, it's a great, you know, I could only hope that, you know, I live long enough to see my father get in there. You know, and I think maybe someday he may. I'm thrilled that Richie's in there. He belongs there. When Richie was inducted last year, Lynn Major, Al, and Tommy and I had front row seats. And that was like the biggest thing in my husband's life to see him get inducted. So yeah, we've stayed very close with the family over the years. Anything he got, he earned. And I think anybody that raced at Waterford or Westboro or, you know, Bowman Gray Stadium in North Carolina, anywhere, you know, you know, they could relate to the guy because he had probably grown up like most of them had grown up and they all knew that. And he had made it to great heights like they thought maybe they could. He was, without question, you know, the king of the modifieds. Well, I'm out of your side. 